the mandarins draw their power from the law and the people from the secret societies. A Chinese saying. Last winter, I read a book on the Chinese Tongs called Primitive Revolutionaries of China, a study of secret societies in the late 19th century by Fei Ling Davis. Maybe the first book on the subject ever written by someone who wasn't a British Secret Service agent. In fact, she was a Chinese socialist who died young. This was her only book. And for the first time, I realized why I've always been attracted to the Tong not just for the romanticism and the elegant, decadent chinoiserie decor, as it were, but also for the form, the structure, the very essence of the thing. Sometime later, in an excellent interview with William Burroughs in Homo Core magazine, I discovered that he too has become fascinated with tongs and suggests the form as a perfect mode of organization for queers, particularly in this present era of shitty old moralism and hysteria. I would agree, and extend the recommendation to all marginal groups, especially ones whose jouissance involves illegalism, potheads, sex heretics, insurrectionists, or extreme eccentricity, nudists, pagans, post-avant-garde artists, etc., etc. A tong can perhaps be defined as a mutual benefit society for people with a common interest which is illegal or dangerously marginal. Hence, the necessary secrecy. Many Chinese tongs revolved around smuggling and tax evasion, or clandestine self-control of certain trades in opposition to state control, or insurrectionary political or religious aims, such as overthrow of the Manchus, for example. Several tongs collaborated with the anarchists in the 1911 revolution. A common purpose of the Tongs was to collect and invest membership dues and initiation fees in insurance funds for the indigent, unemployed, widows, orphans of deceased members, funeral expenses, and so on. In an era like ours, when the poor are caught between the cancerous skilla of the insurance industry and the fast evaporating charybdis of welfare and public health services, this purpose of the secret society might well regain its appeal. Masonic lodges were organized on this basis, as were the early and illegal trade unions and chivalric orders for laborers and artisans. Another universal purpose for such societies was, of course, conviviality, especially banqueting. But even this apparently innocuous pastime can acquire insurrectionary implications. In the various French revolutions, for example, dining clubs frequently took on the role of radical organizations when all other forms of public meeting were banned. Recently, I talked about Tongs with PM, author of Bolo Bolo, published by Semiotext. I suggested that secret societies are once again a valid possibility for groups seeking autonomy and individual realization. He disagreed, but not as I expected because of the elitist connotations of secrecy. He felt that such organizational forms work best for already close-knit groups with strong economic, ethnic, regional, or religious ties. Conditions which do not exist or exist only embryonically in today's marginal scene. He proposed instead the establishment of multi-purpose neighborhood centers with expenses to be shared by various special interest groups and small entrepreneurial concerns, craftspeople, coffee houses, performance spaces. Such large centers would require official status or state recognition, but would obviously become foci for all sorts of non-official activity, black markets, temporary organization for protest or insurrectionary action, uncontrolled leisure, unmonitored conviviality, so on and so forth. In response to PM's critique, I have not abandoned but rather modified my concept of what a modern Tong might be. The intensely hierarchical structure of the traditional Tong would obviously not work, although some of the forms could be saved and used in the same way titles and honors are used in our free religions or weird religions, joke religions, anarcho neo pagan cults. Non hierarchic organization appeals to us. But so too does ritual, incense, the delightful bombast of occult 
orders, tong aesthetics, you might call it. So why shouldn't we have our cake and eat it too? Especially if it's Moroccan majoun or baba o absinthe, something a bit forbidden. Among other things, the tong should be a work of art. The strict traditional rule of secrecy also needs modification. Nowadays, anything which evades the idiot gaze of publicity is already virtually secret. Most modern people seem unable to believe in the reality of something they never see on television. Therefore, to escape being televisualized is already to be quasi-invisible. Moreover, that which is seen through the mediation of the media becomes somehow unreal and loses its power. I won't bother to defend this thesis, but simply refer the listener to a train of thought which leads from Nietzsche to Benjamin to Bataille to Bacht to Foucault to Baudrillard. By contrast, perhaps that which is unseen retains its reality, its rootedness in everyday life, and therefore in the possibility of the marvelous. So the modern tong cannot be elitist, but there's no reason it can't be choosy. Many non-authoritarian organizations have foundered on the dubious principle of open membership, which frequently leads to a preponderance of assholes, yahoos, spoilers, whining neurotics, and police agents. If a tong is organized around a special interest, especially an illegal or risky or marginal interest, it certainly has the right to compose itself according to the affinity group principle. If secrecy means A, avoiding publicity, and B, vetting possible members, the secret society can scarcely be accused of violating anarchist principles. In fact, such societies have a long and honorable history in the anti-authoritarian movement, from Proudhon's dream of reanimating the Holy Vem as a kind of people's justice, to Bakunin's various schemes, to Deruti's wanderers. We ought not to allow Marxist historians to convince us that such expedients are primitive and have therefore been left behind by history. The absoluteness of history is at best a dubious proposition. We are not interested in a return to the primitive, but in a return of the primitive, inasmuch as the primitive is the repressed. In the old days, secret societies would appear in times and spaces forbidden by the state, that is, where and when people are kept apart by law. In our times, people are usually not kept apart by law, but by mediation and alienation. Secrecy, therefore, becomes an avoidance of mediation, while conviviality changes from a secondary to a primary purpose of the secret society. Simply to meet together face to face is already an action against the forces which oppress us by isolation, by loneliness, by the trance of media. In a society which enforces a schizoid split between work and leisure, we have all experienced the trivialization of our free time, time which is organized neither as work nor as leisure. Vacation once meant empty time. Now it signifies time which is organized and filled by the leisure industry. The secret purpose of conviviality in the secret society then becomes the self-structuring and auto-valorization of free time. Most parties are devoted only to loud music and too much booze, not because we enjoy these things, but because the empire of work has imbued us with the feeling that empty time is wasted time. The idea of throwing a party to, say, make a quilt or sing madrigals together seems hopelessly outdated. But the modern tongue will find it both necessary and enjoyable to seize back free time from the commodity world and devote it to shared creation, to play. I know of several secret societies organized along these lines already, but I'm certainly not going to blow their secrecy by discussing them here. There are some people who do not need 15 seconds on the evening news to validate their existence. Of course, the marginal press and radio, the only media in which this sermonette will likely appear, are practically invisible anyway, certainly still quite opaque to the gaze of control. 
Nevertheless, there's the principle of the thing. Secrets should be respected. Not everyone needs to know everything. What the 20th century lacks most and needs most is tact. We wish to replace democratic epistemology with Dada epistemology. Either you're on the bus or you're not on the bus. Now, some will call this an elitist attitude, but it is not, at least not in the Seawright Mills sense of the word, that is a small group which exercises power over non-insiders for its own aggrandizement. Immediatism does not concern itself with power relations. It desires neither to be ruled nor to rule. The contemporary Tong, therefore, finds no pleasure in the degeneration of institutions into conspiracies. It wants power for its own purposes of mutuality. It is a free association of individuals who have chosen each other as the subjects of the group's generosity, its expansiveness, to use a Sufi term. If this amounts to some kind of elitism, then so be it. If immediatism begins with groups of friends trying not just to overcome isolation, but also to enhance each other's lives, soon it will want to take on a more complex shape. Nuclei of mutually self-chosen allies, working, playing, to occupy more and more time and space outside all mediated structure and control. Then, it will want to become a horizontal network of such autonomous groups. Then, a tendency. Then, a movement. And then, a kinetic web of temporary autonomous zones. At last, it will strive to become the kernel of a new society giving birth to itself within the corrupt shell of the old. For all these purposes, the secret society promises to provide a useful framework of protective clandestinity, a cloak of invisibility that will have to be dropped only in the event of some final showdown with the Babylon of mediation. Prepare for the Tong Wars.